Alright guys, so it, we are resuming the 2015 released chemistry SOL and we're just going to finish it up with questions 40 through 50. Okay, so um, uh, again, this test was the uh, 2015 chemistry SOL uh, and so these are questions that the state of Virginia used back in 2015. So. You can use this as kind of a guide to what to expect. And we finished off on question 40. All right, so using only one trial to collect data in an experiment uh, causes us to be less reliable because you have to repeat yourself in order to know that you're getting a consistent result, okay? Um, a common product of an acid-base neutralization reactions, it's usually a salt in water. So any acid, uh, so H plus paired up with an anion, so maybe this is chloride, maybe this is fluoride, maybe this is sulfate, and this is H2SO4. Uh, a base is usually like sodium, a metal with hydroxide, so sodium hydroxide or lithium hydroxide. It's basically just a double replacement reaction. So the, the metal would be paired up with the non-metal here. So if this were sodium and A was chloride, this would be sodium chloride. Uh, and uh, H plus and OH minus form HOH, but we write it as H2O, it forms water. So acids and bases always make an ionic compound, which is also known as a salt and uh, water. Okay. So based on the information provided, which solution is a base and a weak electrolyte? Okay, so a strong electrolyte would have a bright light bulb using the light bulb test. A weak electrolyte would have a dim light bulb with uh, the light bulb test. So the weak electrolyte, we're looking for a dim bulb. So we're looking at um, either this one or this one. Uh, but base means a pH greater than seven. Uh, this would be an acid. So if they had asked uh, an acidic solution with a weak electrolyte, it would be this choice, uh, but a basic solution weak electrolyte, it would be that. If they had said strong electrolyte, uh, basic solution, we would be going with that, okay? Because it's bright, so strong electrolyte, and it's basic, okay? This would be a neutral electrolyte, strong electrolyte, right here, okay? Um, here we got a half-life graph. Um, just without even reading the question, um, we're starting at 80, what's half of 80, 40, and it took 16 hours. So look, look, look what happens after another 16 hours. So if we go from 16 hours to 32 hours, we went from 40 to 20, so we cut in half again. So every 16 hours, the sample's cutting in half. Um, so the half-life is 16 hours, and uh, that's what the question asks, okay? So again, they might ask other questions pertaining to half-life and that kind of thing, but if you see a graph like that and you're asked for half-life, you just, you know, find a place where you can see where it cut in half and, and, and how long how long it took uh, to take to cut in half. Okay. Um, so here we got uh, a bromine molecule, a Lewis dot structure for a bromine molecule, and it's asking. Uh, what type of bond is shown here? And uh, it would be a covalent bond because it's non-metal sharing electrons. That's what this dash means, we're sharing two electrons. So covalent bond. But when remember, when there's no electronegativity difference, so if they're the two two of the same element bonded to each other, that would mean there's zero electroneg electronegativity difference between this thing and that thing. That would be a non-polar molecule. The more polar, the more the bigger the difference in electronegativity, the more polar the bond. So if this were bromine and this were fluorine, that would be a polar covalent bond because there would be an electronegativity, electronegativity difference. But since it's bromine and bromine, no difference in electronegativity, so uh, a nonpolar bond, okay? And polar or nonpolar are always covalent. It's just, is there an electronegativity? So is there an electronegativity difference? If there is, it's a polar covalent bond. If there's no electronegativity difference, it's a nonpolar covalent bond. And remember, the bigger the difference in electronegativity, the more polar the bond, okay? Um, all right, um, so this is just asking what, which of the variables based on this experiment would be the independent variable. Remember, the independent variable is the variable that you change 
and then you see how the other variable changes based on the changes you made to the independent variable. So the dependent variable depends on how you change the independent variable. So um, if we look at it, uh, it was looking at the browning of apples, so basically the oxidation of apples, um, by using different pH values. Uh, so the thing that the student controlled, the thing that the student changed was the pH values, and then the browning, how much browning there was of the apples would be the dependent variable. The browning of the apples is dependent on the changing of the pH. So the independent variable is the pH. Okay. All right, number 46. Um, we got 0.1 grams of CO2 with a volume of 0 0.056 liters at STP. Uh, an experiment produced 0.1 grams of CO2 with a volume of 0 0.056 liters at STP. If the ex accepted density of CO2 is 1.96, what is the approximate percent error? So this one, you know, tough one, because we have to first figure out the experimental density. We, we were given the experimental mass and the experimental volume. So we have to do the mass divided by volume to find the experimental density. So when I do that, that's 1.8. So remember, percent error is the difference between the true value and the experimental value. So we would do 1.96 minus 1.8. We could do 1.8 minus 1.96 because we would take the absolute value of that. But what we have to make sure is we divide by the correct value. We have to uh, divide by the true value, okay, not the experimental value, okay? So make sure we divide by 1.96 here, not uh, 1.8, okay? Uh, but regardless, even if we made the mistake of dividing by 1.8, we probably, we wouldn't get any of these as answer choices. So what we have to understand is this is not percent yield, this is percent error, and you have to do the subtraction of the two values and then divide it by the true value times 100. Uh, but we had to know how to get the experimental density based on the experimental mass and the experimental volume, okay? So in 47, uh, I would definitely go to your visible learning document and go to the end of it to review all the safety symbols because they'll ask random safety symbols. Hopefully you uh, can narrow it down. Um, maybe if you saw this, you might think skin irritant because of what's happening with the hand. Um, but skin irritant would only be showing an effect on, you know, a human or skin, uh, not an effect on material. So this means corrosive, um, toxic would have maybe, you know, like poison or skull and crossbones, that kind of thing, a health hazard. Uh, it's hard to describe, but it's got like a, an X across, uh, somebody's chest, um, but uh, you can look up, just look, just Google MSDS warning signs to see them all. Um, but this one is, just means corrosive. Okay. All right, here on the actual chemistry SOL, you'd be like clicking on all the things that you would need. Um, this is just circle the lab equipment you would require to determine the density of a solid. So you would need a balance to determine the mass. You would need a graduated cylinder to determine the water displacement of that mass of metal. And if they give you an option, at any time you're doing the lab, if goggles is an option, click goggles. You always got to wear the goggles. Okay. All right. Now, this one, the way the uh, SOL works, th works this question is they give you a couple of dot structures to choose from. Okay. So you don't have to write the dot structure, so you don't have to come up with it um, on your own. You just have to know which one is the right one. Um, but BF3, boron is not a metal. So these are, you can, boron's a metalloid, but you can call it a non-metal in this case. And so we would, this is a covalent compound. We would use the uh, prefix naming system. The Roman numerals are only for ionic compounds and you don't always use them for ionic compounds. We just have to know we use the prefix naming system when it's covalent. So one boron is boron. Um, we would use mono for the second element if the second element, we only had one of them, but it would be boron and then our prefix for three is tri and we change the ending of the second element to I. So boron trifluoride would be the right name. And this is its dot structure. 
if you were asked about shape, that's trigonal pyramidal. Or no, I said, ah, trigonal planar. If there was a lone pair also on the boron, uh, that would be trigonal pyramidal. But when you just have three bonds and no lone pairs on this, the thing in the middle, that is trigonal planar. Um, and be careful. Remember, boron is okay with just having six valence electrons in its final dot structure. So just having two, four, six is good. So just remember that for boron. Boron's okay with six. And if you see boron with three things, it's always going to look something like this. It's going to be trigonal planar geometry. And then the last question of the test, we have to interpret the solubility chart. And notice on the y-axis it says solubility. It's how many grams of the salt can dissolve in 100 grams of water. So notice the question is asking 200 grams of water at 70 degrees. So we would go to 70 degrees, and it's asking about potassium chlorate. So potassium chlorate is here. So 70 degrees, potassium chlorate. So 30 grams, but that's 30 grams in 100 grams. So if you can dissolve 30 grams of potassium chlorate in 100 grams of water, how much could you dissolve if you doubled the water? You could double the chlorate. So not 30 grams, it would be 60 grams in this case. If this had said 100 grams of water, then it would just be 30 grams. If it said 300, it would be 90 grams, right? So just kind of understand how to read that. Okay. All right. So we have the this practice test, which is an actual test from uh, a few years ago, more than a few years ago, almost 10 years ago, but all right. Uh, and we have um, the practice items, the 27 practice items that are on test now that you can test yourself and you can watch the video of me going through them. Okay, so doing that and then doing a bunch of practice, JLab practice, and, and getting your questions answered anytime you have a question leading up to May 16th, you should have, uh, um, or whatever date you're taking the SOL. I said May 16th because the year I'm making this video, you're taking it May 16th. But if you're watching this video in another year, it might be another date in May. But if you're taking the chemistry SOL, doing all this will help. Um, it'll help you, you know, prepare. And again, yeah, we want you to do your best. We hope you get a perfect score, but um, we just want you to pass. We want you to get that verified credit. Okay. All right. Um, have a great day.